Good evening, good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Open Door webinar show, the live property development webinar show from Property CEO. Of course, you guessed it was Property CEO because we've got the logos in. Actually, they're that side, aren't they? They're that side, right? They're that side. It's difficult when you're actually looking at a reverse picture, but to see if you can do it here. Where's the logo? Uh, the logo is... <laughs> yeah, you can do it either. It's not that easy, is it? Anyway, my name is Richie Clapson, and I'm here, of course, with the other half of Property CEO, Mr. Ian Child. It's great to have you here. And just in case this is your first time, uh, let me let you, you know what you've let yourself in for. Our aim is to give you 45 minutes. Uh, if it's just over, we do apologize, but it certainly will be no more than an hour. 45 minutes is our aim, non-stop positivity. And it's all set around the theme of business and property development. Isn't that right, Ian? Uh, it certainly is. Uh, Richie and I run a company called Property CEO, and basically our day job training people how to become successful small-scale property developers of course many people really quite like the idea of developing property uh, but often worry might be a bit risky a bit complicated so our job is basically to give them the support and the training that they need to be able to do it safely and as, uh, as successfully as possible and we also believe that there's quite an amazing opportunity out there uh, at the moment we've got the recession coming up we've got all sorts of things that have happened kind of as we've gone through the uh, the coronavirus crisis and coming out of the back of that hopefully which is going to create a lot of opportunity for developers so we wanted to help people find out where those opportunities are and see if uh, development might be a good fit for them that's right you know global pandemic we love all those things don't we recession bring it on we'll have a bit of that because these things create opportunities but only for those that go out there and seek them out. If you sit there and just wait and watch everyone else, nothing will happen. So you've got to get out and make things happen. So as always, we're going to be serving up advice, predictions, guests. Yes, we have a guest this evening. And of course, I suppose in the format here, it's a bit of training. But above all, we're going to have a bit of fun doing it. Now, we will be taking your questions as we go through. And as always, if you don't have any questions, we are just going to sit and stare at the camera and stare at you. And I can assure you that's not going to be much fun for 45 minutes for either of us. OK, so we're going to introduce our guests in a minute and let's get started and see who we've got on. It's always good to give a bit of a shout out to you lot out there, isn't it? Who are our CEOs this evening? Well, Yvonne's on, Rob's on, Deb's on, Sue's on, Deal. Good evening, Deal. Deal was a guest of ours. He's a part of also there. He was on a few months back. Simon's on, Raj and Raj. Now there's two Rajs again, Raj M and Raj M. So I don't know which one of you is number one, but let's assume you are both equally top spot in the Raj camp. Ranjit's on from Property Investor News. That's fantastic. Haven't seen you for a while, my friend. Property Investor News, that's a good read, I would suggest. Pardeep's on, Roma's on, Mansour's on, Sammy's on, George, Stephen, Helen, Sarah, Peter, Hajinda, Will, Debbie, and there's more of you, but I'd sit and be here all evening just reading out names and that's completely pointless. And actually, uh, Ranjit from Property Investor News says, good evening, Richie, Ian, and all the lovely peoples. That's all you lot as well. So that's good, isn't it? Excellent. I love it. Debs is on and she says, good evening, gents. Very formal, isn't it? Uh, great to see you. Apologies for not being on last Thursday evening. Well, to be honest, Debs, we cancelled the whole show. You weren't here. and We said there was a waste of time. We put a message out. Everyone else agreed. So we didn't bother. But she said they were tied up with an international property deal. Ooh, look at that, eh? And the, and the difference got the better of us. Oh, the time difference. It's just only a clock. You've just got to work out where you are. Anyway, give us a hands up, please, if you can see and hear both myself and Ian. I think we're wrapping on for five, ten minutes. Yes, the hands are up. We, that's correct. Debs has said, or maybe it was the wine. Yeah, that's that true. That time true. Karen's just joined us. Hello, Karen. She's just logged on. Karen, you're late, but you've not missed much. We've just been rabbiting on and giving a bit of a shout out for a few names and talking about Debs and her international property deals and the way she missed last week's show because she doesn't know how to tell the time. But anyway, sure. that aside. We have a guest this evening. So uh, who'd, like to see, who'd like a guest? Who'd like a guest on? I'd like a guest. Hands up if you want a guest on, please. I'm looking at the screen. Hands up. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Not, and you and me. Excellent. Well, uh, we have brought him back by popular demand. And uh, hi, guys. Nice to see you, says Karen. Nice to see you too, Karen. And uh, we brought him back by popular demand. We have got Alex Smith on this evening from Artisan Environmental. Now, Alex was on in back in Open Door 15. When was that in? Was that June or July? June, July time, yeah. Back, uh, back in the summer. Back in the summer. So we had Alec on then. Uh, he was good value. He was great. He rabbited on for ages, answering your questions. But it was really good value stuff. But we primarily talked about asbestos. 
And so we didn't cover virtually nothing to do with, with contamination, Japanese knotweed, all that sort of thing. So we asked Alec to come back and uh, we've managed to secure him this evening. So uh, hopefully without further delay, we'll see if Alec is there and we get him straight on and uh, welcome him to the show. So uh, first of all, Alec, can you hear me? Are you there? I am here, hello. Great stuff. Turn your camera on from your friend. Yes, we can see you. So can everyone please give me a wave if you can see and hear Alec. Yes, they can see and hear you, Alec. They are very happy. Um, perhaps I should ask them to give me a wave if, you, if they're happy that Alec is back. <laughs> Not sure no, about that. No waves. <laughs> Guys, put your hands down. Put your hands down. Put your hands down. Love it. Love it. Alec, welcome back to the show. We are so pleased to have you back here. I mean, we we just the time flew last time you were on back in show 15 and all you talked about was asbestos you just banged sorry, on about I'll, asbestos. I'll try not to rub it on so much this time you're not going to rub it on i'll try not to maybe i'll try to keep things a little bit more brief is that a promise maybe yeah anyone who knows alec who knows that he knows his stuff he certainly does he's been around this game for many many years not as many as me because he's considerably younger but he has been knocking around this game for many many years and once you get him started on asbestos and contamination he's off he's off i mean i don't think i want to invite him for dinner because i think that would get boring but as a technical subject it's really quite interesting so what we thought we'd start with this evening uh we'll give you a bit of chance to throw some questions in the chat box for us is we thought we'd ask Alec to um, uh, put him on the spot now to give us perhaps a, a 10 minute overview. Now, Alex talking for 10 minutes is not a problem, I can tell you that. A 10 minute overview about contamination. Just give us uh, a few pointers of things we should be looking at, and then uh, about 10 minutes ish, and then we're going to start firing into some questions. So, Mr. CEOs, all you lovely lady CEOs, male CEOs, pop your questions in the chat box, and we will put them to Alex in 10 minutes or so. Alex, take it away. Certainly. Um, OK, so I think with, with contamination, I think the main things you want to consider or people might want to know about would be what is it uh, and how, how, how can it affect you? Uh, you know, what, what do you need to consider uh, with regards to, to property and deals that you're looking at? And uh, I guess what, what can then be, be done about it to, to reduce your risk and be compliant and what have you? So starting at the beginning with, with what it is, it'd be classified as any man-made or natural products or materials that are harmful to health, that are harmful to human health. Um, and generally, it would be kind of products in the ground. I mean, it could, could be in buildings, um, but as a, you know, we, we offer sort of geo-environmental services and anything sort of geo-environmental would be related to, to what's in the ground rather than what's actually in, in the building itself. And that generally what's in the building, like asbestos surveys or lead and paint and what have you, would typically be covered by different uh, specific surveys to look at those elements. And the contaminants, so some examples of the contaminants that you could find in the ground would be Things like metals, uh, oils, and and sort of byproducts of oils, like sort of PAHs, uh, TPH, PCBs, uh, asbestos. So you could actually get some asbestos loose, asbestos and materials actually in the ground as well from uh, from old demolition or you know construction, various other sort of previous historical projects on that site. Um, arsenic, cyanide, herbicides and pesticides from agriculture, and then you've also got sort of ground gases. VOCs and, and radon. So there's a kind of a whole whole host of sort of nasties that could be kind of lurking uh, in the grounds. You know that you're not really going to want on, on your site ideally, or certainly not in in kind of significant levels that, that may cause you an issue. Uh, and the kind of the sources uh, of those contaminants, the kind of things that they could come from. Uh, you've got industry. So you sit historically, kind of uh, uses like laundries printers petrol stations anything kind of motor industry that you know you're working with kind of oils and anything related to oil um the construction industry so the production of construction materials and supply of those materials is, is quite typically there's quite a wide range uh of uh, of, of of building material you know construction and production of building materials that, that can produce contamination uh, and manufacture as well quite quite a few manufactured processes that that can produce um, various contaminants as well. So any any of those industries that you've, if you've had that previously on the sites, it could, could be an issue. 
Uh, then you've got farming as well, so you've herbicides, pesticides, uh, and also fertilizer. So phosphates, and of course, um, it quite quite topical in recent months would be nitrates. So where we've had the nitrate issue in the solvent re region, um, that that's uh, obviously one example of uh, an issue uh, where contaminants is is kind of impacting quite heavily on on, on planning in the construction industry. Uh, infrastructure as well, so roads, rail, transport bridges, gas pipes, sewage, that kind of thing. Um, there can all be issues from all of those elements that could cause contamination. Um, and then domestic settings as well, kind of anything. Generally, not so much of a problem, um, but you could still get asbestos, lead from paints, heavy metals, old building wastes, you know, there's been, someone's knocked down an old garage and done previous work, or even from when a house was originally built, where you have contamination uh, in, in the grounds. Uh, in, in domestic properties as well so it could be anywhere and come from anywhere so it's uh, yeah potentially sort of quite a quite a significant uh, issue if I'm not looked at and, and dealt with properly um, then who who can it affect so you've got home and and building and landowners um, and with with that group you've got potential financial losses so if you're looking at selling your site and then it's found you know in a in a survey that your buyer has done that there is contamination they're going to have to deal with that's potentially going to devalue uh, your site or your property uh, and if you're just on managing the, the property or site on an ongoing basis then you've got the cost to remediate the, the, the site potentially as, as well so you've got potentially unknown costs there um, and there's potential unforeseen liabilities and legal issues as well so if, you, if you're renting out a property you've got a duty of care for the overall health and safety of tenants so if you've got contaminants in the in the ground or asbestos or anything in the buildings then you are potentially liable for for, for any kind of exposure during that tenancy then the other group you would have is investors developers and and their stakeholders um, well, I'm sure so many many of uh, you guys listening are uh, and again you've this financial implications so if you're looking at buying a site you would likely want to factor in potential costs if you know it can be very very expensive to to remediate a site if there is contamination. So it's always worthwhile kind of looking at, at, at potential for, for contamination in the ground. Uh, I've seen liability, sort of similarly with uh, if you're owning the property. Um, also implications on schedule of work. So if, um, you know, like with asbestos removal, if, if it's something that you leave to the last minute or it comes up as an unexpected issue, then there could be quite significant disruption and you know on, on and well both cost cost and time penalty penalties on what you're planning to do and what you're doing with with the uh, development so really is you know it's potential risk to to everyone um but, but you know from all of that side of things but also a risk to health as well um i guess you may not think of it as so much as a risk to health but if you have got significant contamination you know like you think about lead and mercury and that kind of thing but it's the same with a lot of the contaminants that if you have got an exposure to that over time then there is a significant health risk as well and what we we do as a consultancy to, to help clients to to limit their risk with with contaminants um there are kind of three sections how am i doing for the time oh, have, I, have, I, have i hit 10 minutes yet or? do your little pitch bit now go for it <laughs> so yeah to, to kind of uh, sum up before richie tells me off uh i've uh, initially you've got potentially a phase one desk study so that is an appraisal of the site uh, and a preliminary risk assessment to look at the potential for contamination uh, on the site um, so considering the site itself is history geology hydrology um, and um, so it's you know no nothing's tested or anything it's just looking at you pulling in big data sets to look at what's been done on the site and we'll typically also as well include a site walkover, so a reconnaissance survey to look for things like uh, anything kind of immediately obvious, um, like, you know, oil tanks that are spilled and that kind of thing that, that may not be picked up by that external data. Um, in that, we can consider the kind of potential sources of contamination, uh, the receptors, so people, or buildings, um, you know, who, who could be um, exposed to that contamination. And then also look at the potential pathways of how that contamination would get to those receptors. 
Um, so that's your phase one, that's another like death study. You then got uh, an intrusive site investigation where you would quantify the risk from, from the potential contaminants identified in that phase one. So you would go in and either dig trial pits or actual boreholes um, to, 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 to extract sort of soil samples and then get that tested in the lab in the laboratory to actually test for for the various range of contaminants uh, and that could either be soil uh, water or, or ground gases and then finally uh, if there are contaminants identified at significant levels that would cause an issue uh, you may need to look at remediation of the, the site so if that's required we would then do um, an option appraisals and so we'd look at the most cost effective and pragmatic way to deal with the contamination uh, and then work alongside ground workers and with them to supervise the works um, as to what would be most cost effective, whether it's capping it uh, in, you know, in the grounds, uh, excavating and removing from sites or, or treating it in situ um, or a mixture, a mixture of all four. And then finally, you'd sort of validate those results. So you do some final testing to validate that everything's been done properly and you're all clear. Excellent. Brilliant. Now that's good. I think that's really useful to give that overview. And I know you've crammed a lot in there in a very short space of time, but hopefully that has been really useful. I've been watching the questions fly in as um, as you're talking there. So we have a, quite a few questions, so we're going to do our best to get through as many as we can for you folks out there this evening. And uh, Nick's just joined us. So Nick, welcome on board. And Alison's joined us. Mrs. P, she says, sorry, I'm late, but I hope you had a good summer. Yeah, we had a great summer, Alison. Thanks very much for asking. Right. Are you ready for the first question, Alec? Different. Okay, so first question is in from Sammy. And Sammy says, uh, I'm developing a building with a concrete slab that I'm leaving in place. Do I mm -hmm. need to establish whether the land underneath is contaminated? Okay, so I assume then that's kind of a, a commercial conversion. So the slab's staying in place okay. and whatever you're doing with that, it's okay. Um, the short answer is if if there's no planning condition that's put in place as part of PD or planning that stipulates that you have to do a an investigation for contamination, then no, there's no reason why you would need to to go to the trouble of digging it up, checking or what have you. You could you could leave that that in place. Uh, you know, I, you've got to look at the kind of the potential for exposure. So if you've got a, a building there already, a uh, slab there already. Uh, and there's there's no chance that really you know you you're going to be able to kind of access that from the ongoing use and, and habitation occupation of the building. There's no reason to check underneath it. Um, the only thing you may want to consider is is kind of garden space really. You know if you're going to have residential and people film families kids digging in the garden, um, then that might be an area you might want to do some to some checks just to check check there's nothing there. You don't want the kids digging and coming out all glowing like the ready brick kids, do you? <laughs> Definitely don't. Yeah, got, a, got another one for, for Alec here. I've got a cracker in from Bob uh, who asks, uh, how intrusive do you need to be? If I'm having a survey done prior to purchase, will the vendor object to having the survey done or do you make good, etc.? What would you say to that? Okay, so... Uh... Where it's it's where it's generally with 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 lands rather than buildings, it's less damaging and intrusive than say an asbestos survey may be with a building. So with asbestos, where we would normally only be able to do prior to purchase a management survey, where we're not pulling the place apart, and we can't very often do a refurbishment survey where we kind of cause a lot of damage in the building. You know that would be an issue potentially prior to purchase. So we would do it. Two-phase survey. We'll just find out as much as we can from a management survey prior. With with ground contamination, because you you know, well, you've got two phases. One would be that that phase one desk study where you know the the the, the vendor would know we've been there because it's done from the site walkover and all of that external data. Just looking at the likelihood of contamination, you know, so that's well worthwhile doing because it's it, it's a very thorough. Uh, inspection and, and does pull in a lot of data from um, a lot of different sources on you know the full history going back a long time of, of, of the site uh, as well as you know when you're looking at kind of the details geology and hydrology as well and how the, the, the you know the likelihood from the soil types that the that, that contaminants could have been you know absorbed through uh, water tables etc there's a lot of data that's looked at that would give you a very kind of comprehensive um reports uh and, and likelihood of contamination um but 
whether that identifies potential contamination or if there's any other reason to suspect it then if you wanted to actually do some whether it's just some small bores or small trial pits then really that's they're, they're fairly non-intrusive but you know a borehole would just be quite a small small hole like this because they can very easily be um, covered and, and, and capped very simply and quickly uh, and a trial pit would typically, typically be just a hand dug you know relatively shallow pit that can be filled in a big trial pit. <laughs> yeah yeah so um yeah it's you know you're talking kind of less than a meter you know a meter wide by half a meter to a meter max deep so it's it's, it's you can sort of fill it in pretty easily it's going to be similar to to, to to checking existing foundations and that kind of thing so yeah so, you, so it, it can be done pretty simple pretty easily really yeah, to whatever levels the sort of hole that you could bury a small business partner in is what you're saying <laughs> you like <might> option <laughs> Good stuff, Bob. Hopefully that answers that question. And funny enough, Ian, and, and I, I don't think you'd seen this, but this follows straight nicely on to Rob's question. Not Bob, this is Rob's question. And Rob says, I looked at a site beside a graveyard <laughs> uh, and was made aware of contamination from human remains. How serious could this be? Contamination from human remains, Alec? Yeah, you've got to be very careful with that. It can be kind of really really quite nasty um because so it's, again you know what you'd want to do uh, so our um our geo environmental guy richard is really really good at kind of assessing sites and looking he'll look at things like lidar surveys and, you know, and um, look at the actual topography of the site of um waterways pathways and flood zones etc and the kind of thing because like you know he'll look at what the likelihood of say uh, the water table moving into the what would be like the, the live kind of area of the graveyards and and back out where you so you could have like Alec, can i just stop you there there are no live areas of the graveyard so clearly uh, alex with the last episode do not know what they're talking about only at halloween uh, <laughs> so yeah so, so so within the area of the graveyard that affected by uh by, by by bodies and decomposing bodies and um, nasty nasty liquids and what have you that could kind of then leach into that water table and surrounding areas. Um, so it, it, it depends uh, on on a number of factors like that, but it's certainly something we can you know investigate in quite detail to to, to look at the likelihood of there being issues from it. But it's definitely worth worth checking that properly just to, oh. to, to make sure it's not going to be an issue. Rob, uh, we're going to give Alex details out at the end of the show. Maybe uh, reach out to Alec and he can uh, he can come down to your graveyard to see if there's any uh, life in it at all, in any shape or form. Ian, what have we got next? Um, I've got one uh, in from me, actually, uh, which is uh, my usual one, which is the uh, the kind of one of the most common mistakes that uh, that you think you you see developers make when it comes to uh, to contamination generally, Alec. Uh, yeah, I think it's so. One of the things I think is is kind of um, kind of naivety or complacency. I th you know, I think a, a lot of people are unaware that that it's a thing that 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 contamination is an issue or a potential issue that is something that needs to be considered. So I think it's something that's quite often overlooked because people just aren't aware that it, it that, that it's worth considering. Um, so, so e e either that or, or or maybe to an extent that kind of mindset that I've not had an issue before and so I'll probably be fine if I don't look at it um you know we find the same thing with uh with asbestos I think we discussed a similar thing last time didn't we that I think yeah people people kind of get get away with stuff as such on a on, on a project and it doesn't crop up as an issue then um there might be maybe a level of complacency kind of moving forward um I think as well sort of trying to kind of save time and cost up front by maybe kind of doing things on the cheap just sort of saying i'll just find finding someone as cheap as possible to do a couple of little tests and things really not kind of getting looked at properly and thoroughly um it's a bit of a false economy so yeah that would be another one and presumably um, in worst case scenario uh if you do find something belatedly and you bought the site then you could be in for a, a bit of a, a an issue with both time and money, could you? 
we've been involved in projects that I mean you might be lucky and it might just cost you you know a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of pounds but yeah the, the biggest kind of one we've we've seen in Wolf down in Wolston near the old hospice site um, cost them nearly a million pounds in remedial costs it was quite a fairly big development but yeah it was that's a big cost that they could have done without that they didn't know about at the beginning. Wow that's fantastic thank you only a million, isn't it? A yeah. question from Raj. Is the site of the former coal slag heap a non starter? Um, I think that's something that there'd be a lot to, 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 to look into that. So I'm not going to be able to. Yeah, that would be one for my colleague Richard. Um, so I wouldn't say it'd necessarily be a non starter uh certainly wants to kind of look at that in detail but i think even more so than the graveyard there might be quite a few factors to to look into so by all means if you want to get in touch ping us an email i can ask my colleague richard to uh have a chat with you and um yeah let, let, let you know have... that's good i think that's good if you are interested and anyone out there to be fair we are you know scratching the surface of this subject this evening and putting alec on the spot and getting him to give us some quick answers but I think the really important thing, if you've got a serious site, reach out to Alec and he can pick that up. And there are certain, it's such a complex subject. You could even just in, in a 10 minutes overview, Alec gave us, there's so much to this. And uh, yeah, absolutely. You're going to have a number of specialists there in that firm to help. So Richard sounds like uh, he's the man for you, Raj. So connect he's up with him. Uh, stuff. Yeah. 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 So I'm more the asbestos there. guy, so, but I can give you an overview of this stuff. But anything like really, really in detail, or like, yeah, Richard's your man to talk to. Alex the Espessos, guys, you do not want to go out for dinner with him. He's not the sort of guy you want to hang around with. We're like pointing out Artex on the on the restaurant ceiling and what have you. Yeah, Very yeah. exciting stuff. Okay, what have we got another question, Ian? Uh, we've got one in from uh, Mansour. How do you find contamination if the property is newly painted to cover it up? And I guess that's a uh, maybe a general question on that would be just kind of in any situation uh do you come across situations where people have looked to disguise contamination issues and how do you uncover it yeah so i mean with, with contamination you are really looking more at the soil the ground rather than within the building itself so um with 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 the building it is more things like lead paints um asbestos i guess they they probably you know in a lot of within buildings they they're probably your two two biggest ones asbestos being the one that will generally cause you the the biggest sort of headache and risk um and even if it, but with asbestos even if it's been covered up painted and what have you a good survey will typically pick up all, all almost of it because there's quite often um telltale signs uh, you know if you're kind of looking into little gaps within um you know architect you know just the, the, there's normally little gaps or say say above suspended ceilings you can then kind of look down into voids where the wall's been studded off and you know quite a lot of little nooks and crannies and areas where you can you can find just a little edge that you can sort of see something's been covered up um so that you know that, that can be done to to certainly kind of just reduce reduce risk at, 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 up front um but it's yeah it's sometimes hard if it places if some, something's just been fully renovated and skimmed and everything is kind of brand new especially if you haven't got that suspended ceiling and everything's just completely plastered there is always that that potential for something underneath but if you're you know if you're managing that building kind of then ongoing as it is and you're not planning any significant work work on it then you just kind of got to balance balance that risk and the particular project deal, the age of the building and the likelihood of there being something there. So I guess there's a number of factors you'd want to consider. Fantastic. Mansour, I hope, hope that helps. There's another question that we, uh, we just skipped over from Mansour earlier, which is a really good one. So Mansour, two questions this evening. You are a very lucky man. It says, uh, hi, Alec. And this one's quite formal. I like this, a nice bit of an introduction there. Uh, which types of properties are more prone to have Japanese knotweed and how to ensure that the property is free from Japanese knotweed. So what sort of properties do we find it in and how can you maybe ensure that a property is free from it? Yeah, OK. Um, well, I went, I went to visit my uncle a couple of weeks ago in Wales. He sort of lives um, it's sort of just south is of... Is uh, just a general story? Or is yeah, 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 it's got nothing to do with knotweed. I thought I'd just tell you a story about one of my uh, kind of trips. 
Um, and like that, look, we went for a walk by a river, and like that was absolutely, I've never seen so much not weed in my life. Like we've sort of a couple of mile stretch, sort of, you know, sort of between a river and houses. It was just solid Japanese knotweed. So I, I think the stuff um, definitely likes uh, waterways. And I guess like there, it was probably the maybe a lack, lack of management and cutting the stuff, keep, keeping control of the stuff, but maybe the water as well. But I think the types of properties, um, it, there's not necessarily a type of property because knotweed is such an invasive that species that it can work its way through anything. You know, once it's established itself, then, um, you know, so even if, a section of of not weed is kind of you know stick to a bird or something like that and those rhizomes kind of drop somewhere and take hold and then and it actually establishes itself then um you know it kind of it works as a series of uh kind of rhizomes and, and, and sort of root systems under the ground which then kind of works its way up through kind of anywhere it can find a way out causing and that's kind of what causes a lot of the damage it can it can kind of work its way through very tight, small fissures in brickwork and concrete and stuff, and then push that all apart and causes a lot of damage. So, um, yeah, there's no kind of set type of property or sites, really. Um, it, it, right. it be anyway. How did it come to this country? Do you know how it started? I, I don't. Uh, I think it's been around for a good while. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I guess from the name, it's uh, maybe, maybe with came over from Japan as a, as a possibly as an ornamental like oh this looks nice I'll, I'll plant that in my garden <laughs> um because yeah it's got quite a pretty pretty leaf so if you you know if you're planting that as a as a as a climber type type plant you know it sort of initially it looks quite quite nice until it it takes over your whole garden yeah yeah I think the, uh, the Victorians brought it over um and what I heard actually was that that the railway companies planted it uh, alongside the railway tracks because um, it was quite a good yeah. Uh, good screen. So uh, um, yeah, big thank yeah, you. So I, yeah, so yeah, talking about property types, actually, yeah, I'd, I'd sort of railways cross my mind, and actually, I guess that that would be a key place to look if you've got any properties near railways. Then then yeah, for that reason, there is there is still quite a lot around around the railways where it was planted. And how can you remove it? Uh, so you've got two two methods. You can either treat it. So there are companies that will come in and chop it down to root level, chemically treat it, and then they will um, come and monitor that over another couple of years period. So they'll 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 put there'll be an insurance backed warranty on that. But for that to be valid, they need to have that monitoring period just to sort of check that it is has been the treatment has been effective and it's not going to come back. Um, so that's that'd be one way if it was in an area of land that you're not developing but then if you have to actually if you can't monitor it because you're covering that area back up with something a building extension or what have you then the only way would be to dig out the full root system so you've got to dig down the uh, excavate that full amount of spoil down to um, up to a three meter depth uh, and then all of that would have to be disposed of contaminated waste which is going to cost you Four to four times the cost of um, standard sort of spoil disposal. Yeah, wow. Well, so you need to know you need to know whether you've got it or not. Great stuff. Okay, Ian, let's fire another question at him. Okay, I've got a I've got a question here from Harjinder, uh, but I think that there's a few that follow a similar strand. So I'll read this one out and then perhaps just add to it a little. So Harjinder asks, do I only need to have an environmental survey done when the building has a known history of 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 housing potential contaminants. So you know, he's given the example of a car workshop or a chemical store, etc. What about where I'm buying an old warehouse or an office block to convert? So I suppose the kind of general question there, perhaps in addition, is also when should any developer be considering hiring your services? Yeah. Um, well, it, it it's it, it, as I sort of mentioned in the, the beginning, um, sort of just talking through um, kind of the implications of contamination and kind of where the kind of previous you know site history. There's a there's a lot of potential sources, so it's you can't you know it'd be quite rare that you could sort of say oh you know from that this building won't have any chance of having contamination. You know, there's there's always a chance that it would be there. So. 
you know, as part as acquisition acquisition due diligence, like it, it, it's always worthwhile considering at least that phase one death study, um, just to kind of look at into the, like that more more detail at the the potential contamination. Um, yeah, it, it, of course, if it's a, a higher risk, potentially higher risk site, and you sort of know that there's been a history of something with potential contamination, you may want to con consider checking a bit more in depth, but yeah, a death study would be worthwhile for any acquisition, really. And is a death study particularly expensive, Alec? Uh, it's so. So, death death study would sort of typically be six, seven hundred pounds. Um, so there is quite a lot of work involved, and you know, where you're sort of having to sort of pay for the various data sets as well as that sort of site visit. And there's quite a lot of work involved with kind of analysing that and uh, and then putting the report together. So yeah, it's, it's 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 typically a little bit 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 more than than, than say the asbestos survey would be. Yeah. Um, it can save you a lot uh, yeah. you know, in the long run. <laughs> it's an insurance policy, isn't it? Yeah. But that, that. Okay, Yvonne. Yvonne's got a question here. So uh, Yvonne, good uh, good evening to you. Uh, what would cause arsenic and cyanide contamination? I have heard of a Victorian orchard site in central London that has uh, these contaminants. Okay. Um, to be honest, that'd be one for Richard again. So I, that's not something I'm hugely knowledgeable on about, you know, a lot of the sources of specific contaminants, I'm afraid. Um, you know, yeah, that so, so, sounds interesting. I, 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 I'm interested to find out more about that, to be honest. So, yeah, maybe, maybe we should both have a chat with Richard and find out. Yvonne, so uh, Yvonne, if you uh, if you email Alec Direct, uh, it's worth making contact with him anyway. Uh, Yvonne is actually one of our students uh, who is uh, hopefully going to be embarking on some developments very soon. So Yvonne, reach out to Alec and get in touch with Richard. Um, and that yeah, would be a very interesting uh, question to answer. OK, let's pick this one up from Will. Uh, Will says, is it worthwhile getting death studies done or would you always need to go to site to do an inspection? So with a with a death study, it is we, we always try and recommend uh, that, that reconnaissance survey. Um, it, you know, you, it could be done without the site visit, but, but you are sort of mi missing sort of a number of potential kind of issues that wouldn't be picked up by purely external data. Um, so, you know, as I sort of say, you know, potential leaks, leaking tanks, um, cracked sewage pipes. Uh, so it is, it's certainly worthwhile um, to, to doing that site visit. And we would always sort of try and re recommend that, that that would be included. Um, you may find as well that uh, if, if if a phase, if a death study has been um, sort of stipulated as a, a planning condition, then mm -hmm. they would uh, insist on a, a site visit as part of that, and they yeah. may sort of re refuse the uh, refuse it if uh, if it's not included the site visit. They are will. So you probably need to get an investigation done, and it's interesting to go back to what Alex said earlier, where people skimp on employing professionals. I, I was speaking at an event the other week and uh, I was talking about exactly that subject where newbie, some newbie developers out there are, are trying to resist having to pay out professional fees and cut corners. And it really is foolish. And that's just because you don't know, perhaps those people don't know enough about what they don't know. You know, we just hear this overview from Alec at the beginning of, I mean, you know, you're, you're frightening yourself silly with some of this stuff. So you need these professionals on board. If you can't afford to pay a few professionals fees, you shouldn't be doing development. But you need to know what you don't know. So it's so, so important. So we'll hopefully that's taken that on board. OK, and what do we got next? I've got one in from Colin. Um, if you find that land is contaminated, what can be done about it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a... Yeah, quite, quite, quite a lot sure, of the question. There's, there's yeah. lots and lots of different scenarios. So it depends what the contamination is, where it is, what is planned for the site, um, how deep the contamination is, uh, all lots and lots of factors. So that is why we do that um, by that by that stage. If it's something that that you know, it, it may be that nothing's needed. Uh, so if you've got, you know, you've got kind of safety limits as such, or you know, limits with each type of contaminant that would be um uh, considered as reasonable um and that's one that's different for different contaminants 
and it was, it's also different depending on what the usage is, it is so whether it's going to be below a building below a slab a car park within a uh, commercial green space within residential garden space it, there's different different levels depending uh, and different considerations depending on what that end use will be um but yeah as part of that remediation sort of strategy that we would look at we we would always like look to reduce the cost for you as much as possible by by doing it in the most sensible way so we were in, you know some again that's that that kind of cost saving things you might you might pay someone a little bit and they will say oh yeah just um just take the whole lot as a contaminated waste and it'll cost you eighty thousand pounds you know really what you should be doing is looking at um minimizing that maybe you know re reusing some of it as backfill capping it and, and mixing up the strategy of what you do uh in different areas of the site depending on what is happening so we'll always do uh that that strategy um or create that strategy report to minimize the, the cost as much as possible fantastic colin hopefully that answered your question Okay, let's see if we can get one or two more in. I know we're getting close to quarter two, but let's see what we can do. Peter's question this evening. Uh, Peter says, good evening, Alec. Enjoying it so far. But are there any types of building or land that you would point blank avoid when it comes to acquiring a development site? I mean, I'm thinking things like petrol stations and stuff like <laughs> that. Yeah, um, not necessarily point blank avoid for, for the sake of it. I mean, ones to be wary would be directly over an old landfill site uh you know a bit of a can of worms there um potentially uh, you know so it's, it's not impossible to develop over uh, you know on top of a landfill site uh but obviously there, there, there's a lot of um consideration and, and and potential kind of costs and safeguards that you you would need to to look at so you know it would need to be a, a particularly attractive deal you know with a, a very high margin i think if you want to consider um consider that um i guess yeah similarly with say petrol stations you know i guess they're typically you can pick them up at a relatively good price but yeah you've got to consider that in most applications you're going to have to remove the tanks which is going to be very costly so there's going to be quite a significant cost in remediation of, of that site from all of the the, the the actual tanks themselves and quite likely surrounding you know there's a good chance that they'll have leaked into the grounds so then you've got an unknown um kind of quantity of, uh, of additional ground and spoil to remove from where you've had contamination from leaks and what have you as well. Uh, so yeah, they, that, that could potentially be very, very costly. Um, unless you are looking at a use that you could leave the tanks and say a vehicle, you know, a, a car sales fork or something like that, there might be a, a business type that you could just leave everything as it is and, and, and run that from there or another petrol station. Or another petrol station. Peter, hopefully mm -hmm. that answers your question. Ian, do you want to choose one quick one that we can try and do with Alex so we can get one more in? Well, Devs and Curiosity has got the best of her. She asks, uh, when or if contamination needs to be removed, where does it go? <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's the same with a lot of this stuff. It's it, it hazardous waste landfill sites. Uh, so same with asbestos, same with contaminated spoil. Uh, you know, you've you, you've got waste sites and they will classify waste in different 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 categories and they will they will treat it and um sort of put it in different areas uh accordingly uh, and cap it accordingly depending on what it is sorry am i freezing a bit there can you hear me okay yeah you were freezing a bit i thought you were just acting up <laughs> um so <laughs> So, so, so yeah, uh, it, it goes in the grounds um, as part of like the the, the if, if 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 you're getting to the point where spoil is having to come out, um, we would um, carry out um, what's called uh, WAC testing, um, so waste acceptance criteria. So you're analysing the the soil to inform the, the the receiver, the waste site of of how you know how how they would uh, treat that, whether it can go in a less sensitive area or if it needs to be in say a a sealed cell um, if it's a higher risk material but generally it all goes into a, a landfill site which might be why you don't want to consider buying landfill sites in the future to build on good stuff love it love it excellent alec as always that has been terrific guys 
girls out there listening, you uh, wonderful family of CEOs of ours, uh, I do apologise. We apologise that we haven't managed to answer all your questions. They flood in. But hopefully uh, we picked a few out, a uh, bit of first come, first serve, but also picked a few out to try and get a good flavour of, of information out of Alex, to pump him for as much information as we could. But Alex, uh, you're happy for people to reach out and connect up with you and um, you know work on their projects for them, yeah, I guess? Yeah, of course, please do. Um, so, yeah, anyone that didn't have questions answered, feel, feel free just to give us a shout, you know, happily kind of talk, talk through um, any And your details are, my friend? Examination. So uh, the the main uh, email. So if you you can speak to sort of whether it's Adam, Richard, myself, um, probably the easiest would be contact our our main one, which is office at artisanenvironmental.co.uk. Uh, our number is 01329 800 650. We'll take a look. Say those two things again for me. Sorry. Two things. Say those two again. Yeah. So office at artisanenvironmental co.uk and the number is 01329 800 650 and that's all on our website as well which is artisanenvironmental.co.uk great stuff well we're going to put alex details uh on the show notes uh, on the youtube channel so you can pick them up and contact them if you didn't gather or catch those in time or didn't have a pen handy alex thank you very much uh we're going to have to get you back at another time when we can find a slot in a few months time We'll bring you back again at some point if you're willing, yeah? No, of course. Um, yeah, maybe we can talk about uh, a, a, a property uh, deal um, rather, rather than asbestos. Well, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk more about asbestos and con contamination and all cool. of this side of things. Great yeah, stuff. No, of course. Alex, nice thanks very much and enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, see you soon. See you soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, as always, he was great, wasn't he? interesting stuff interesting stuff you don't know what you don't know well absolutely i mean uh that first 10 minutes you scare yourself silly if you're not careful with some of this stuff wouldn't you so uh, guys hopefully you enjoyed that we're going to put alex details in the show notes uh please uh as always let us know just as we finish off if you've enjoyed tonight's show that's always good to see our next show uh, is thursday the 17th of september where we have will lucy back from luck capital a few of you may remember he was on before our summer break. Uh, then he was off and then he was on. Then he was off and then we cut him because his signal went. So we are hoping for better luck next Thursday. So Will's coming in and we're looking forward to that one, aren't we? Ian? We are. I still watch the reruns of the, uh, the old show because I wasn't on it. I was quite enjoying tuning into it uh, to see um, seeing how you dealt with it. I mean, a marvelously, uh, a marvelous job you did, I have to say. Uh, but hopefully Will's uh, internet connection um, I think he's uh, he's perhaps getting his good lady to pedal a little harder on the uh, on the broadband router, um, so that we yeah we get a good connection. But um, he's a, he's good value as well. And if you're interested in getting finance for your projects, then um, yeah, no better person to ask than a commercial broker. One would suggest. So Will Lucy next Thursday, same time, same place. Please bring a colleague, uh, introduce to friends if you think they'd be interested. Uh, uh, in these shows, it'd be great to have more people on. And we have a Facebook group out there. If you're not part of it, business owners creating wealth through property development, please apply to get in. It's a close group and uh, all being well, if you behave yourself, we will let you in. So guys, thank you very much. There's a lot of thanks coming in. Thanks guys, says Karen. Sarah says, terrific show as ever. Will said, love you guys. Uh, hey, the 18, thanks for another show, says Raj. Deb says, thank you, Richie and Ian for getting on some amazing guests. And Alison says, thanks, chaps. And Nick, thanks, guys. Missed first section. Sorry, pesky kids. Will I better watch replay? Yes, you will, Nick. Replay on YouTube will be up in the next few days. Uh, pop on there. In fact, you can see all the replays. Uh, I saw a few people join quite late. So if you want to go back and pick those up, then you can do. And uh, good night, chaps, says Rob. And uh, good, see you tomorrow, Richie, uh, says Ranji. Yes, of course, I'm presenting tomorrow on Partners in Property. So I will see you there. Absolutely. And finally, Jackie says, thanks again, as always. Have a good evening. Goodbye. See you soon. Take care. Bye now.